Handcuff Releases Under Difficulties, The Remarkable Feats of Harry Houdini, from the Scientific American, July 20, 1912. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Among the well-known vaudeville entertainers must be mentioned Mr. Harry Houdini, whose celebrated feats with handcuffs, straight jackets, and various restraints used to confine the insane and fractious are well known. The public always seems to be interested in seeing the other fellow get away from a tight place, so that it is little wonder that Houdini's audiences are always large. Our attention has recently been attracted to a number of feats which he has been performing in New York and other cities, the culmination of which, perhaps, is the aquatic box trick which we will now describe. On Sunday, July 7th, Mr. Houdini invited a party of newspaper men and those interested in magic to witness a very remarkable box trick on New York Bay. This event was scheduled to take place at a pier on the East River, but owing to police interference, the scene of operations was transferred to the deck of a large lighter which was towed to the dock of the quartermaster's department at Governor's Island. As this was federal property, the police could not interfere with this act. A large wooden box, 40 inches long, 22 inches wide, and 24 inches high, was provided. This box was carefully examined, and no indication of panels, bolts, or springs was detected. After divesting himself of his outer clothing, and after a committee had seen that he did not have any concealed keys or devices for picking the locks of the handcuffs, he submitted cheerfully to be manacled with leg irons, two pairs of handcuffs, and elbow irons. Any of the spectators had the privilege of bringing their own handcuffs if they so desired, as Houdini does not care about furnishing articles of this kind when he is making his more important tests. The cover of the box was removed, and Houdini crouched in it in a stooped position somewhat resembling the doubling up of a jackknife. The cover was then nailed in place with 36 wire nails, and the entire box was banded with band iron, or, as it is technically known, packed for export. On each side a length of iron sewer pipe was secured and iron sash weights were introduced into the pipe, thus affording a convenient method of weighing down the box so as to cause it to sink to the level of the water. Two hundred pounds of iron was used. Holes had been bored in it to permit the entrance of the water so that the box itself could be readily submerged. The box was then carefully roped so that no escape from it could have been possible had the nails and band irons been non-existent or have given away. Some of the planks from the lighter were removed, and the box was shoved out on them and was finally dumped in the water. In exactly a minute and ten seconds, Houdini emerged from the water, swimming toward the lifeboat which had been provided. The act was witnessed by thousands of spectators who crowded the decks of three ferryboats. The box was hauled onto the deck with the aid of one of the spars of the lighter, and the box was carefully examined. Nothing was found in it except the useless manacles which had failed to bind Houdini under the most adverse conditions. Considering the danger of this feat, and the entire absence of any paraphernalia such as traps, etc., it appears to be all the more wonderful. This may be regarded as one of the most remarkable tricks ever performed, and it is only regrettable that a feat of this magnitude cannot be tried before a larger gathering of spectators. Houdini's box tricks, his milk can trick, and similar entertaining feats will not appeal to the average person as much as his bridge dives, which have taken place in all parts of the world. We are able to show two or three photographs which give an adequate idea of the remarkable nature of a feat of this kind. In one of the engravings we see Houdini with his hands manacled behind his back and his arms also confined by elbow irons. This photograph was taken just before an 89-foot jump at Sydney, Australia. The next photograph shows the agonized face of Houdini after he struck the water at the wrong angle. Blood flowed from his nose and mouth. This goes to show that the career of the professional strongman, jailbreaker, and handcuff king has not been altogether unfraught with danger. Several of his imitators have tried similar feats with disastrous results, such as broken ribs, and even two of them paid the penalty with their lives, being drowned with the manacles still on their wrists. Owing to the uncertainty of an act of this kind, if unsuccessful, it would be almost impossible to rescue and resuscitate a person before he is drowned. A third photograph shows the position of Houdini's body in his famous jump from the Queen's Bridge, Melbourne, Australia, in March 1910. His hands were heavily ironed behind his back with handcuffs, and he succeeded in reaching the surface in a surprisingly short space of time. In this case, he was under water about two minutes. A gruesome incident occurred at the time of this dive. 
The shock of Mr. Houdini striking the water was great enough to bring to the surface the body of a man who had been drowned some days before, thus naturally adding greatly to the excitement. We do not pretend to give any explanation of Houdini's performances. We can only say that he states that most of the public exposés of tricks of this kind are absolutely worthless, as they would not work in practice under the severe conditions of a committee of examination. Possibly some of our readers have original solutions of these mysteries. If so, we should be pleased to hear from them. End of Handcuff Releases Under Difficulties, The Remarkable Feats of Harry Houdini Read by Leanne Howlett